the Phantom Troop backstory caught us by surprise and has left a very strong impression on most readers of Hunter x Hunter. Chapter 397 is widely considered the best chapter post-anime, and for good reason. This backstory elevated almost every single moment with the Phantom Troop since we first saw them back in York New. But the reception has been pretty mixed. I have seen a fair share of people who felt underwhelmed and didn't really like the backstory for a couple of reasons. Some thought it was too generic of an origin story for the troop, as well as thinking the backstory was just way too short. I will be discussing all of those things later on in the video, but before that we're going to be doing an extensive recap of the backstory as the title of the video suggests. There are timestamps in the description if you don't want to hear the recap and would rather go straight to the analysis, but I highly suggest watching because I will be adding my own spin and interpretation of a lot of stuff along the way. Without further ado, let's begin. Nobunaga and Finks are having a conversation about the High Lee's behaviour. Nobu thinks that the Mafia family is very much like the Phantom Troop, and Finks completely disagrees, saying they're nothing alike. Nobu responds by saying that they used to be just like them. In the beginning, they were fumbling in the dark, searching for a purpose. Resignation and anger were the sole driving force for the Phantom Troop, and this conversation serves as a trigger, where we transition into the backstory that took place around 15 years before the beginning of the series. Krollo was 11 years old here, and he is 26 years old in York New. These chapters are fittingly named Formation, since they show us how the Phantom Troop came to be. In the beginning, they were just a group of children from Meteor City, and besides Krollo, they didn't really stand out from the rest of the city's inhabitants. They simply lived out their days rummaging the junkyards, looking for anything worthwhile among the scraps, and most importantly, they didn't always get along. At first, we see Krollo, Franklin, and Shaunog together. Uvogin was with Machi, and to nobody's surprise, Finks and Phaeton were close buddies. The two steal a tape from Krollo, Learning Gelman Volume 20, but it's revealed to us that he was hiding another tape. As we later find out, this was a sneaky trick from Krollo since he didn't need the tape that was stolen from him. He had already mastered Gelman, and he was hiding the one that he truly wanted. He goes to the Church of All Faiths, which is a pretty beautiful building that stands out from the rest of the city. But before he gets there, we get some brilliant narration that provides context to the society of Meteor City. People born there don't have certificates of societal identity to prove their existence, so on paper, they don't exist, and terrible people took advantage of that fact. The people of the city were not considered human, which meant it wasn't a crime to hunt them down, and we can only imagine the dark and twisted activities that took place there. They were murdered for entertainment, because evil people could fulfil their deepest, darkest desires with zero repercussions. There were hundreds of victims every year, with 70% of those being children under the age of 15. In order to combat this, the people of Meteor City allied with the Mafia, exchanging personnel for a guarantee of safety. The elders of the city began to manifest Nen abilities which gave rise to a pledge that eventually became the Law of Retribution. Only life can compensate for a life. This is where the Meteor City motto comes from. We reject nothing, but don't ever take anything from us. They were constantly taken from. They were always in a state of fear, until they finally decided to become the ones who were feared. Pakunoda was one of the only other people in the city to spend time in the church alongside Krollo. The church's elders saw a lot of potential in Krollo due to his natural brain power. He had mastered two languages in a very short span of time, completely self-taught. Around 40 chapters ago, Krollo said that his Sun and Moon ability, which he used against Hisoka, originally came from an elder in Meteor City, and I suspect it's the same one who comments on Krollo's potential, considering there is a Sun and a Moon behind him in the panel. Krollo and Paku play the tape he stole from Uvogin, but to their disappointment, all they see is a black screen. However, upon fast-forwarding a few minutes, there's actually something on the tape. The program Power Cleaners, which is an obvious nod to Power Rangers, and there's also some really cool symbolism to the choice of this specific program, which I'll touch upon later. The program is obviously in a language that everybody in the city doesn't understand, which makes Krollo ask for a favour from Pakunoda. He wants to dub the program so that they can share it with all the other children in the city. 
Pakunoda accepts, and then Krolo's about to ask for another favour when she says exactly what it is. Krolo was going to ask her to get Sheila and Sarasa to help out in the dubbing. Paku was very intelligent for a little girl, and she goes on to state all of the reasons Krolo would want them to help out before he could, which makes him blush and say he loves her. That panel is just absolutely adorable. Krolo as a child is this warm ball of happiness who radiates his positivity to everybody around him, and that's just devastating to see with the context of how he is now. Krolo today is such a stark contrast to the child he was in this flashback. This specific scene really stung when I first read it, considering Pakunoda isn't alive anymore, specifically because she sacrificed herself for everything Krolo stood for. Sheila and Sarasa show up, who are two new characters in the main manga, but one of them we've actually seen before in Kurapika's backstory. Sheila is the girl who was stranded in the Kurta forest and befriended Kurapika and Pyro, giving them the Dino Hunter book and discussing the outside world with them, which further inspired the two boys to want to leave the forest. There's a bunch of interesting stuff surrounding Sheila's character. If you're subscribed, you've probably already seen my own theory, but I'll link it in the description just in case you haven't. There is so much potential for this character in the future of Hunter x Hunter, and I cannot wait to see what Togashi has in store for her, because it's definitely something crazy. On the other hand, Sarasa is completely new. We've never seen or heard of her before. The name Sarasa did appear in Greed Island on someone's binder, but apparently this is a mistranslation and it's supposed to be written as Sasara. Regardless of the spelling, that's definitely a coincidence because we see this Sarasa die in this flashback, which explains why we've never seen or heard of her before. Definitely still worth mentioning though, I've seen a lot of people theorising with the Greed Island panel and there might be something there, maybe Sheila used her name or something, who knows, but... Since it's a mistranslation, the chances of that are very, very low. The chapter ends with a very ominous page of children being abducted. In the middle panel, we see a man whose arms are covered in tattoos smoking a cigarette. This man looks very similar to Sarajnik's tattoo artist, who is stated to have previously been a member of the Haile family just one chapter before this one, which I do not think is a coincidence. 396 opens up with everyone being invited to a special assembly, which is obviously the power cleaner's performance. Uvogin threatens Krollo before the assembly since he stole his tape, which is a cool little detail since Uvogin has this mini character arc where he goes from initially opposing Krollo to becoming his biggest advocate. The performance begins and Krollo, Pakunoda, Sheila and Sarasa are behind the stage dubbing as the program plays. But then the video cuts out. We see all the kids momentarily disappointed by that, but what follows is even sadder. A lot of the kids just accept that everything in Meteor City is broken and has been thrown away as trash, so of course it wasn't going to work for long. Krollo notices that and takes it upon himself to continue the performance, this time without the video and on the stage, alternating between the different voices and personas of the power cleaners until the video continued playing. It's a really heartwarming scene, and Krollo being this master performer as a child is just so fucking cool, especially when you think back on York New and how he served as a conductor for Uvogen's Requiem, which is another type of performance but twisted in a much darker way than it is here. He also plays the villain role at one point which gives us the most standout page of the chapter and serves as foreshadowing for his speech in the next chapter. After the assembly is over, it's time for Krollo to feel Uvogin's wrath, which he is fully prepared for. He feels like he deserves it for stealing the tape. But of course, Sarasa intervenes and we get this beautiful moment of her walking up to Uvogin, turning around and then mimicking him, calling Krollo amazing and saying they have a better opinion of him now. She essentially dubbed Uvo, which completely broke the ice and of course she was absolutely right. Uvo was charmed by Krollo's performance and he requests to voice the next monster. Then Nobunaga asks to join, then Feitan, then Finks, then Shaunark and Franklin. Machi though, she's good off that, she doesn't really care which is actually really fitting and reflects her behaviour in the present. This apathy continues for some time as Machi refuses to fulfil the roles offered to her but she would happily play the role of a villain. The group are chilling and having a conversation when they decide to call themselves a troop, but there was still no idea for what they would name themselves. It was just the something troop for now, and we still don't know where the phantom part comes from. 
Uvo learns to dream. He says that at first he was someone who would have been happy to do just about anything as long as it gave him a purpose, but now he has a clear defined goal in life. The desire to tour around the world with Krollo in a play and be the best villain in the world. Really powerful with the context of York New. Togashi is an evil dude for giving Uvo and Paku some really hard hitting moments in this short backstory. They have the most focus out of every member of the troop besides Krollo and that's actually a brilliant choice. They're dead, which unfortunately means we can't get any more of them in the present, so capitalizing on them in the backstory was really cool and makes these moments feel even more special. The chapter ends very similar to 395, with a sharp cut to another very ominous page of the abducted children. This time though, someone we know is on the page. Sarasa is going off to the forest alone to find tapes for performances and at the same time, the kidnappers have something absolutely detestable in mind. They've made their quota for delivery, so they want to find one last child to have some fun with. And that brings us to chapter 397. Arguably the best chapter of Hunter x Hunter since 339, the final chapter adapted in the 2011 anime. The group are missing three people, Franklin, Nobunaga and Sarasa. The first two are just late, which is standard behaviour for them and something that was actually mentioned in York New. Uvogin thought their lack of punctuality was unacceptable and Nobunaga actually mentioned that whilst mourning his death. Sarasa though, this is very out of character for her so the group is getting very worried. They look everywhere for her but she is nowhere to be seen and Krollo is visibly distressed by this, beginning to cry as he cancels the performance. And then they check the forest. And the forest is where we get the page. The infamous tree panel that Togashi used to announce his return to drawing this manga after four long years. Nobody expected this from the first storyboard he posted on Twitter. Nobody expected that tree panel to be one of the most horrific and painful moments in the entire manga. Sarasa's mutilated body parts in a bag hanging from a tree with a single note in German. And of course, Krollo being the only person who can read and understand the words, refuses to share. Uvogin asks multiple times, what does the note say? But Krollo refuses to say it. He swears to never speak of those words. His mouth will be sealed even if Uvogin tried to kill him. This is honestly one of the coolest mysteries in the series to me. I can't see why Togashi wouldn't just tell us what was said if it was something simple, but the fact that it was kept secret tells me there's something very dark and very heavy in those words, on top of Krollo's reaction of course. The group of kids are completely distraught. This tragedy doesn't just traumatize them, it defines them from this moment onwards. They take the bag back to the church where an embalmer by the name of Renko uses Nen to reattach Sarasa's body parts so they can give her a proper funeral. Machi is the first member of the troop to awaken her Nen. She's able to see the aura emanating Renko's body. Renko offers to teach Machi how to perform the special power and that explains the origins of Machi's abilities in the current day, stitching wounds and so forth. They bury Sarasa and then the troop have what might be their most important conversation to date. Krollo asks for three years. He's 11 years old at the time of these events and he promises he will be fully prepared by the time he turns 14. He will ready himself and the system in Meteor City for the troop to enact their vengeance upon the people who killed their friend. Uvogin initially refuses out of anger, stating he wants to go find them right now, but Krollo being the smart kid he is says that trying to find them would be like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And then Krollo lays out his master plan. The world is on the brink of a communication revolution. Infrastructures are being built that will allow the entire world to be connected at the speed of light. A single individual will gain the ability to transmit something seen by the entire world. He is of course describing technological advancements much like the ones we have personally seen in our own world over the last few decades, with the creation of the internet allowing for people to communicate from opposite ends of the globe. Krollo realized that the scene of Sarasa's murder was created with a deliberate framing in mind. It looked like a theater. There were a bunch of cigarette butts which meant there were people watching and enjoying the killing as it happened. And that led him to believe that someone was recording images from that spot. And they considered this sort of stuff to be a type of art, a work they can share with like-minded individuals 
in the world. Krollo's plan is to essentially create the dark web, to prepare a loophole for these vile individuals who wish to communicate on the internet, a virtual hideout where they can evade police pursuits, and in doing so they will find Sarasa's killers and enact their vengeance. Very fitting for the spider to use the interweb to lure their prey, very very fitting indeed. Krollo states that to make this happen they'll need resolve, a strong will and the mental fortitude to devote their lives to this cause. As an 11 year old child he states that when the time comes he'll end up killing a lot of people. He acknowledges that isn't what Sarasa would have wanted but he thinks it's the only way. With how twisted the current criminal justice system is, Krollo firmly believes that this is their only way to receive reparations and prevent anything like this happening again to another inhabitant of the city. In order to fend off villains, he will live the rest of his life as a villain, one that the whole world will fear. And so, he spends the next three years redesigning himself and his hometown in order to prepare for the group's master plan. But before that, he is appointed the leader of the troop by Uvogin. Everybody approves except for Sheila who left the group a few moments prior. They point upwards to display their approval, showing their unity and serving as a statement of their resolve in accomplishing Krollo's goal. Finally, we skip over those three years to the scene that we first saw in chapter 114, the birth of the spider. And there we have it, the Phantom Troop backstory explained, but this video obviously isn't just going to be a recap of what happened in these chapters, I want to dig a bit deeper and talk about this through a more critical and analytical lens. I have a question to everybody watching. What do you think this backstory needed to accomplish? Before 395, we never knew we would ever be seeing the origin story of the troop. But assuming we did know, what would you guys say are the most important things for it to expound upon? Things about the troop in the present that needed to be further contextualized. For me, it needed to establish their original motivations, to show us the inciting incident that turned them into the people they are today. That was the main thing, and perhaps the only necessary thing. On top of that, it would have been brilliant to see their dynamic as children, and the consistencies and differences in their characters in the past and present. And also, to answer various looming questions like, why do they comfortably kill innocent people without a second thought, but feel very empathetic towards one another? They support each other, they would kill for each other, they cry for each other, but they steal and kill other people very casually. Why is there so much religious symbolism packed into a few of the members' character designs and the structure of the group? Why do they allow those who murdered their friends to take their position in the group, in spite of the grief and anger they might feel? Why is Krollo the leader, and how did his identity crisis come to be? These are just a few of various things about the Phantom Troop that hasn't clearly been explained to us. An outline on some or even all of these things might not be necessary. Hell, the entire backstory wasn't necessary, but we did get one, and these are some things I was hoping to see in it. But the irony of this flashback is that for all the answers it gave us, it left us with just as many questions. The backstory ended by giving the troop a very clear and defined goal. They would create a platform for corrupt individuals who murder for entertainment, use that platform to find Sarasa's killers, and finally get their revenge. They will also dedicate themselves to a life of villainy in order to protect Meteor City inhabitants from other villains by instilling fear in the masses. Essentially, they took it upon themselves to become a necessary evil for the safety of their hometown and their loved ones. That is the origin of the Phantom Troop in a nutshell, and it tells us a lot about them, but the interesting thing about all of this is the fact that they have changed considerably since that time. In fact, I firmly believe they've completely moved the goalpost, and that is no longer their mission. Like Nobunaga said in the trigger for this flashback, this is what they wanted in the beginning. Fink said they're nothing like the Haile, and Nobunaga disagreed because they were like them back in the beginning, which means a lot has changed since then. Perhaps they've already gotten their vengeance and were hollowed by it, losing themselves in pursuit of revenge, and now they wander aimlessly without a defined purpose. Perhaps they still haven't gotten their vengeance or just gave up on it entirely. Perhaps their vengeance was deeply tied to the Kurta massacre. There are so many possibilities, but we're not here today to theorycraft. My point is simply that things have changed a great deal since they first came up with this mission. There are so many mysteries surrounding this group and all of them come from the years between the formation of the troop and York New. The spiders formed seven whole years before the Kurta massacre. What changed? What turned them into ruthless murderers of innocent people? 
or were the Kurta even innocent? I think it's absolutely necessary for Togashi to explore those years and I'm not worried because I'm certain we definitely will see more. Perhaps we'll get another extended flashback incited by another member of the troupe, or we could get various small flashbacks that serve as pieces of a larger puzzle. That was how Netero's flashback was presented, piece by piece, starting with the dragon dive and then in his fight against Meruem. For the people who think this Phantom Troop backstory was way too short, I wonder if you felt the same way reading Netero's flashback when it first appeared in chapter 265, and then how did you feel 30 chapters later when we got way more of it? I don't think the backstory is over, like I said I'm certain we'll be getting more flashbacks but it's a matter of patience. And sure I could be wrong, and if I am wrong then we'll have to talk about it because that would be incredibly disappointing to me. In my opinion the most interesting time in the history of this group is the years between their formation and York New. Seeing them slowly but surely break down as they work towards their goal, being chipped away at by the harshness of the world, and being sucked into darkness as they commit terrible sins. That would be incredibly meaningful and elevate every character within the troupe significantly. I don't really like the idea of Togashi leaving that time of their history completely ambiguous because it might just be the most important part of their history. Of course the inciting incident with Sarasa is the most important event, but that time period is what shaped them into the people they are today. I've seen various people criticising Krollo's motivations. Generic, underwhelming, even childish are a few examples of things people have had to say about chapter 397. Nothing will ever satisfy everybody, but the last one's really funny because ironically that's the whole point. Krollo's motivations are many things and one of those things is childish, but guess what? He's an 11 year old child. <laughs> he and the rest of the troop are young victims of a dehumanizing civilization. They live in a society where their existence is completely disregarded and they are considered literal trash by the rest of the world. And of course that has devastating effects on their mentalities, but it's not like they had a natural disposition towards becoming the people they are today. They kill and steal not because they were born to do so, but because they consciously choose to do so. So yes, Krollo's original motivations were somewhat childish, but his behaviour was incredibly mature. He was very steadfast in his decision despite the fact that he knew it was morally wrong. He knew Sarasa would not approve of it, but he felt like he had to do it in order to prevent something like that from ever happening again. This backstory isn't attempting to make the troop a redeemable group or to justify their actions. In fact, it accomplishes the complete opposite of that. They went into this fully aware that what they were doing was wrong. Krollo and by extension the rest of the troop choose to become a necessary evil that is aware of its evil and they all have firm accountability in that decision. They fulfill this role willingly and just because this backstory is humanizing them doesn't mean Togashi is promoting their actions. That's the beauty of Hunter x Hunter, nearly every single character is humanized, even the evil ones because that's the point. Evil is an undeniable truth of the human condition and we all have the capacity to do evil things. Before ending the video, there are a few other interesting little details that I quickly want to brush over. The Power Cleaners program they dub and perform to everybody in Meteor City has some very interesting symbolic weight. It's a program about heroes who clean up the streets and Meteor City is literally a massive junkyard. Krollo is the person who discovered this tape and came up with the idea to dub it and share it with everybody. The same person who the elders of the church had massive hopes for, even saying it would be wonderful if he could help solve the various problems plaguing the city. And then what does he do? He redesigns the city in order to protect them. And even beyond this, he plays the villain role in the performance, which is exactly what he ends up doing in the very next chapter. The events of this backstory explains why members of the troop have the rule of never traveling alone. They are traumatised by the death of Sarasa who was alone when she was targeted. Of course they don't always follow this rule but they are usually in at least a duo. In York New, Killua and Gon didn't want Kurapika to become a killer in pursuit of revenge and through seeing her memories, Finks revealed that she was very thankful towards them for having that mentality. With the context of the troops formation and Sarasa's death, she probably saw herself in the children and remembered feeling that exact same way in the past. And lastly, probably my favourite aspect of this backstory, 
Kurapika and Krollo's dynamic is elevated tenfold due to the events of this backstory. They are wildly similar, but there are obviously distinct differences in their characters. The main parallel though is that both of them are members of marginalized groups who experienced firsthand a slaughter due to the failings of society. In Kurapika's case, Krollo is the one responsible for this slaughter. I wonder who was responsible for the slaughter of Sarasa. If it was the Kurta somehow, man, I, I don't really think so. I, I really don't think so at all, but that would be pretty fucking crazy. It would it would it would be pretty fucking crazy. I really, really, really doubt it, but I'm just throwing it out there to end the video on a bit of a high note. <laughs> There's so much more to discuss, but for now I think I've spoken enough. The Hunter Hunter videos on the channel will not be stopping despite the hiatus because I have so many ideas that I want to turn into videos and I really hope you guys will be here to watch them. If you're not already subscribed, please do for future content on various different Hunter Hunter topics. And with that being said, thank you guys very much for watching and have an amazing day.